welcome to a special Trogues Independent Brewing Showcase episode of... Brutal Battle. So this is a brewery I've been looking to do a showcase for for a while now. Pretty much ever since we've done showcase episodes, which has been years now, I've been thinking we're going to do Trogues at some point, we're going to do Trogues at some point, and we... You know, when you start saying things like that to yourself, you just end up not getting to it. So you just got to do it. Didn't we have, a, like, a lineup and then we just drank them and never recorded? I, you know, I don't remember. I, I don't like remember that. that. my brain. I don't remember that, but there was a very good occasion for us to go ahead and finally do a showcase episode, which is after not having been to Trogues for years, we went for my birthday as part of a celebration. And it was Rebecca, and it was myself, it was Rich Smith, Richard B. Smith Jr., who's been on this <laughs> is, that, sh- is that how he is on the podcast? Is no. It, oh. Well, I call him numerous things on the podcast, oh. but he's been on the podcast a few times before, so he went with us and his lovely wife, Stephanie. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They're great peeps. And so we all went to Trogues. Yeah. We had good food, good beers, how much fun. Food, how much food did you get, Carl? Oh, yeah. I kind of ordered too much food because that's an issue. And we'll talk about it a little bit more when we talk about kind of our actual experience there and the layout of their brewery and tap room. Uh, they have amazingly good food. And I know that's not mind-blowing for breweries. There are a lot of breweries who are doing awesome food at their locations, but uh, Trogues, for me, was one of the first few breweries that was doing, like, highbrow food at not terrible pricing for people coming in for some beers. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, yes, I ordered way too much food. I don't think I, I wasn't able to eat it all, but I did my best, and I was very full. <laughs> so, anyway, let's – um, you need a beer. Yeah. All right. So let's go with the first one is their scratch from their scratch series, which we'll talk about the scratch series a little bit later. If people are not familiar, this is scratch number 377. It is an oat IPA, which is basically their way of saying a hazy IPA or a New England style IPA, but they don't want to say that, I guess. So they're saying oat, but um, it is, how old is this? Canned? I can't even tell. Oh, it's, it's, it's a freshest, freshest buy, buy sometime in September. So when we're recording, we're in almost in July, so we're totally fine. But, like, I have to take my time and say, don't tell me when a beer is best buy. Tell me when it was done, and I will tell you when I want to drink it based on my personal taste. But anyway, it's this beer is 8.2% alcohol, which is more than an IPA. That's <laughs> That's imperial. And it is... I like their extra info on here. It says they have 50% oats and unmalted wheat. The malt is Pilsner, oat, and oat crystal. And the hops are Eldorado, Citra, and Mosaic. So, and 16-ounce cans. And we did have this while we were there, right? We did. Okay. Yeah. We had a few tasters worth of beer. Did we do three tasters worth? Uh, uh, we did. We, we went. Three. We had a lot of beer and a lot of food. <laughs> yeah, we did. Well, I mean, it was for celebrating my birthday, so mm-hmm. worth it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what was I going to... Oh, um, so for a long time, you could not get any of their Scratch Series beers. Um, they certainly do not distribute them, although every now and then they'll have a pack of beers that comes out, and they'll include one of their Scratch mm-hmm. beers, or one of their beers that they have started making a little more regularly because of their Scratch Series Which, you know, I'll talk about it more later about the Scratch series, but it's kind of a way for them to do their R&D with, you know, selling beers. Anyway, what does this Oat IPA look like? Very orange. Yeah. It's it's hazy, but it's not super. It's more just like a little cloudy, that's it. Yeah, it's not super hazy. It's got a decent head to it. Hmm. A little creamy look to it. Mm. Definitely can perceive that pine, that bitterness. Yeah. There is a decent bitterness on the nose. Mm -hmm. So for it being an oat IPA, you usually assume, because that means kind of like hazy-ish, it's going to be kind of more robust nose with not much bitterness in the aroma or the flavor. But I'm getting a good amount of Mm -hmm. bitterness on the nose. I'm getting a little sweetness, a little like maybe like tangerine-y. 
tangerine with a little grapefruit mixed mm-hmm. in there. Um, you're saying there's some pine to it. Mm-hmm. I agree, but I'm also getting a little bit of like a mango added in there. It smells really good. I really like the smell of it. It smells balanced, which is yes. what I really love with my IPAs. You know this, people. I love my IPAs balanced. Mm. Yeah. It's really easy. Yeah. Especially for 8.2%. I was just going to say, I'm not perceiving that level of ABV. No. Not at all. Um, I think also... Is- I'm oh. sorry. I think also the body's not thick enough for me to think 82 mm. Like, it, it, it's much thinner than I would assume for that. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for a little bit more on the... It's uh, not as flavorful as I'd like. I'm perceiving it now. I'm getting a little burn. Yeah. Yeah, I am also starting to get a little bit burned. Uh, so, this has been sitting for maybe a month with us in our fridge. And it's... it's I, I, think, I don't think it's as robust... On those fruit notes as it was at the brewery. So this just kind of also speaks to the freshest by date stamp not being what I want. Because I want you to tell me when did you can it or bottle it. Because then I actually have an idea of when I usually like hoppy beers to be consumed by. Yeah. Not you can tell me and then, you know, I won't I won't have a clue. Well, do you think it was by? It says it's... Best by September 30th? I feel like they're stretching it on that because they would wait August, July, June. So do you think they canned it on May, May 30th? I think they canned it at the end of May, most likely. That's my guess. Well, we were there. We were there like. Before May 30th. Were we? Yeah, see, this is what I'm saying is I think they're going further than three months on this beer. Well, they're at least going four. Yeah. Which I don't, I personally do not like for hoppy IPAs or hoppy beers in general. Yeah. I don't like to go very far. Honestly, my sweet spot is a month and a half or fresher, to be honest, for what I like. Yeah. I can stretch it to two months, but four months, certainly not. Three months, no, not really. But um, anyway, I still like it. Yeah. It's, it's light. It's got flavor to it. Pretty much everything we were talking about in the nose uh, although that yeah that burn is starting to kind of happen as you keep sipping mm-hmm. it. Okay. But this is solid beer. So so tell me more. When I was saying that you know this is a brewery we always wanted to get to, it's because and I know we've talked about this here and there on the podcast. It's a brewery that kind of started our love affair with craft beer in a sense. For me, the first one, first one was Duclaw Brewing in Maryland, but. Um, Trogues then stepped in and played a pretty large part in helping me grow my appreciation for um, craft beer. And that was back, man, it's been years. It's been a long time when they had a location in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Now they have grown, grown a lot. Their distribution is significantly more. And they're in a way bigger, way nicer, way more awesome facility in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And it is a awesome destination place. And we'll talk more about how that's laid out in our things, um, the things we like about it and everything a little bit later. Well, I mean, Trogues for me was, because my beer, my gateway into craft beer was... Dreamweaver. Dream, yeah, Dreamweaver. That's right. And I think I really liked Dreamweaver super early on, but I also really remember falling in love with their um, Rugged Trail, mm-hmm. their Nut Brown Ale. When I was in into brown ales, I loved that. And then I also remember that they were really big in helping me get into hoppy beer. Like with their Hopback Amber Ale mm. it was a really nice hoppy beer. And then their Nugget Nectar. Like that took me to the level of like hoppy, hoppy, hoppy. Mm-hmm. Like crazy amount of hopping and falling in love with it. Because the, the way they did it. Um, so, yeah. Great beers. But, all right, let me get into some of the backstory on them. Uh, Trogues, the actual name, is a combination of the word Krog, which is the Flemish word for pub, and Trogner, which is the last name of the two guys who started it and own it, Chris and John Trogner. So they turned it into Trogues. And they're brothers. Yes. So it used to be just Trogues Brewing Company. Now it is has been for... At least five years now, I would think. 
four or five years now, Trogue's independent brewing company. So when acquisitions started happening of craft breweries, they kind of slipped the independent in there because I think they knew that that was going to start being more of a selling point for people who were craft beer nerds to be like, look, we're independent. No one else owns us. We're our own thing. So, um, so John and Chris Trogner started this together. Like I said, uh, Chris got into home brewing initially and John, uh, he did not get into homebrewing initially, but he just decided, I don't want to work in corporate America, which, you know what, when I hear these stories, good for you. There are a lot of people who really don't want to work in corporate America, but they stay there because they're too afraid to make a leap to something else. So the fact that they made that leap, very nice. So Chris, uh, with his home brewing love, he ended up getting a job at Oasis Brew Pub in Boulder, Colorado in 1995, and that's where he started to get, like, real brewery experience. Uh, he then went and decided to learn electrical wiring, plumbing and welding, and brewing. Um, that was actually John. I'm sorry. John went and learned electrical wiring, plumbing, and welding, and a little bit of brewing, while Chris created a business plan and ended up going to brewing school in Europe. Okay. So Chris, who's the one who got into brewing first and was into home brewing, he went for more formal training in Europe, while John stayed home and was like, all right, I'm going to learn this more, you know, technical, like, mechanics of the brewery. So... They basically, like, divided things up, and they're like, you cover this aspect of what we'll need to know, I'll cover this aspect. But then they both got into brewing, which is important, because if you want to collaborate with your other owner on these beers, you're going to need that. Um, then in 1996, they returned to Pennsylvania, and they opened Harrisburg, their Harrisburg location, uh, with, where, oh, and the very first beer that they hit the market with was Trogue's Pale Ale. I don't... I'm not sure they I do that they anymore. That. I remember it. So they have a lot of beers that initially they were doing regularly that they don't do anymore. Dreamweaver, they still have. Yeah. Rugged Trail, they don't. Hotback, do they still have Hotback? They might not. That not doesn't that ring I a know. bell to me. Yeah. I don't think the Pale Ale's around anymore. Sunshine um, yeah. Pills is still Sunshine around. Pills is still kicking. That's good. Yeah, so um, let's... No, I'm going to give it a little more info. So uh, over the years, they grew and they added iconic beers, beers that actually ended up becoming very iconic. I talked about that hopback beer. That was actually something that they started doing that the technique wasn't being used a whole lot. They were calling it hopback because they were doing what they were calling hopbacking, where basically they were running the beer through dry hops as they were taking it out of the tank, which is, you know, dry hopping now. Uh, Mad Elf, which a lot of people mm -hmm. know, is a great winter beer, high ABV. A lot of people like it because it's like a fruited strong ale that's got cherries and honey in it, and a lot of people love it. And it's a beer that is uh, well combined with their Dreamweaver to make what people mm. call a mad dream, which is a very... I mean, it is a good concoction. I like I like Mad Elf on its own. I know mm -hmm. you don't. Um yeah, I don't like it on its own. But with the Mad Dream. And I like, I think we did, we did a, a Trogue's Pack Attack yes. a while back. Yes. And um, they had, like, do half of this beer, 30 mm -hmm. Fruit Lake. Yeah. And I think that's really fun. And I think I did that on that episode. So if people want to go yeah. back and look for it, it was a Pack Attack episode where it was a Trogue's Pack. And I think, yeah, it had the, it I ended up winner. doing the Mad Dream. It was Dream. a winner one because they yeah. had that mm -hmm. and they also had the Blizzard of Hops, which and they is. had the Chocolate Stout. Yes. That chocolate stat was really good. Um, and I, who doesn't like that little cute elf on that? <laughs> yeah. And then they also, their other, one of their other early iconic beers was Troganator, right. which was a, a Doppelbach that they ended up winning a lot of awards for very early on. So that's a known award winning beer. Um, like I said, their Scratch series they have, which, yeah, we'll talk about more later. When did, I'm sorry, what year did you say? Did you say they opened? 1996. 1996. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so, do, 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 do. Yeah, so when we started going to them, it was probably about 10 years after they'd been open, most likely. Yeah, because probably around 2006, 2005, 2006 mm, is when I don't we started think it was going that to early on, Was it? Yeah, maybe 6, 7, 2006, yeah. 2007. That's not, yeah, probably more like that. 
Gosh. Um, yeah, so their their scratch series is where they do a lot of their R and D. That's where a lot of their beers end up starting. But like I said, we'll talk about that much later because the scratch series is a cool story. Um, in 2011 is when they opened their new facility in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Gosh, wow, that long ago. Yeah, with two brew houses, one for production and the other one for their R and D beers. And the total uh, square footage of that place, 90,000 square feet, well, which is huge. And they expanded, maybe it was always that big. Mm-hmm. But, I yeah. mean, now, well, I mean, they didn't have that upstairs right. area. Maybe that just was always there. It just wasn't open for public. Right. I think, because they have an upstairs area that's, like, offices. And I don't know if the they have a seating portion upstairs now that they didn't have some time ago. And I wonder if that's, they converted some of the yeah. office area or they just built that new. Right. So, yeah, I, don't know, I don't know. But we'll talk more about that with our, you know, experience on it. So their R&D portion of their brew house is in the tap room, and that ends up becoming part of their t- actual tours that they'll do for people. So you can actually see it, like, when you're in the in their main tap room, like, you'll see the brew house behind the main bar, and you can see tours, tour groups going through and, and checking it out. Uh, and this was the most recent number I was able to find. I don't know why, but as of 2016... 89,000 barrels of beer were being produced annually. Mm. So that's, you know, a nice, nice amount of beer. How far is there, how far do they distribute? Oh my gosh. Are they nationwide? I, they're probably not 100% nationwide, but they have a, a large footprint. I know they, they distribute a lot. Um, yeah, they go far, but, um, okay, let's get to our next beer. And this is their boysenberry tart ale. It is an ale brewed with boysenberry, sea salt, and coriander, which leads me to believe this is their take on an, a goza. It is 4.5% alcohol, uh, fermented with lactobacillus and house yeast. And, and it's have, in a 12 ounce can. And we had their raspberry tart when we were there and really liked it. Yes, we did. So I'm assuming this will be very similar. Yeah, so I think this will be our this yeah, this is our first time ever trying their boysenberry the tart. Yeah, we did try the raspberry tart while we were there and I quite liked it. I thought it was really nice. It was like a nice just fruity, flavorful, easy beer. Mm-hmm. Okay, what does this look like? Ooh, it looks very red. Yeah. Like red with a little pink, pink head to it. Yeah. It looks really nice. Mm-hmm. It's I mean it smells mm. salty, fruity. Yeah. And that salt on the nose makes it so soft. Mm-hmm. It just, like, I, that's one of the things I love about Goza's is that you smell like a tartness, but it's also, like, rounded out by, like, the salinity that just makes it smooth. Okay. I don't think I could pick boysenberry. I, say, yeah, I don't. I don't know boysenberries well enough. Uh, yeah, I could just say it's some sort of berry. Yeah. I would probably say strawberry. Sure. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just salty, fruity. It smells really refreshing. It smells a little, there's a little like floral, maybe hibiscus. Yeah. Oh, that's actually a really good point. Yeah, I agree with that. A hibiscus. And I feel like there's also like a slight funk in the nose. But it smells really good. I really love the smell. Yeah. Oh, it's like ridiculously easy. Yeah, it's really good. Um, I was expecting it to have a little more body to it. Which I kind of, I kind of feel like I would like a little more body, but it doesn't really detract from the beer. No, it's just like a super easy sipper. Um, I would like to have the raspberry side by side. Mm, yeah, kind of compare the two. So what I remember of the raspberry, I think I liked that more because I like the flavor profile of a raspberry more. I see, and when you were saying hibiscus on the nose, I feel like I would taste like a floral hibiscus in here for sure. It's like that boysenberry fruit with like a little floral hibiscus. You definitely get a nice salinity that's making it also very soft. Yeah. Um, although, I, I just feel like this is maybe a little too easy of a beer. Mm, I could see that. It's a good... So, I have a coworker who doesn't like beer at all, and I've been trying to get her to try some different, like, lighter style sours, because I'm like, you might be able to drink this. So she just texted me yesterday and said, I had a sour beer I liked. I'm like, well, what was it? And she said it was Trogue's Raspberry Tart. You're like, ba-boom. Yeah. 
Yeah. So again, so this could definitely be a, a, a beer for those who don't like beer. Yeah, I agree with that. Good gateway. Um, it's good though. I do like it. It's refreshing. It's it's got flavor. It's nice. You want to give me a little more of that? Yeah, you can. Sure. So um, let's now in this portion just talk about our experience there. Oh. So when you get there, there's it's kind of by itself the building in Hershey. You know, it's um it's not like it's far away from everything else. Like it's very it's very relatively close to like Hotel Hershey, to Hershey Park, to the staple is it the no it's not the staple center. What's it the giant center? Yeah. Where um the it's Hershey like, Bears play hockey. I mean if if anyone's never been to Hershey, go because there's a ton to do. There's a lot. Including Trogues. Um which is like front and center. Yeah, Hershey Park, Chocolate World, um Zoo America. Um, the outlet, so you kind of drive by all of that stuff, and then there's like a little clearing, and then boop. Yeah, and it, it's got land on each side. Yeah. Of it. So honestly, I, I, if they own that, they could expand further if they need to. Mm. Um, so you get there, and it's very impressive from the outside because mm-hmm. you're just like, this is gigantic. No problem with parking. We haven't ever really had a problem. Well, with they used to have problems with parking, but yes. now they've expanded. Correct. So. And when you first go to walk in the beat in the front, they have, and they didn't have this a long time ago, they have like a beer garden outside mm-hmm. where they have like a little trailer that has taps. So they have some, not everything, but they have just a few select beers on tap out in that beer garden if you want to, you know, sit outside. And they have greenery that kind of goes up trellises around mm-hmm. you to kind of like cover the sun a bit. Is it hops? Are they growing hops I there? Know. I didn't, I didn't look too closely. Yeah. I was just like, it's There's greenery. an outdoor fire pit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's definitely, there's outdoor options and then yeah. you go in and there's a very large store. Yeah. To the pretty much, well, immediately to the writer bathrooms. Very important. You need those. Then there's a staircase that goes up that would go to where there are offices and everything are. Then you go around where that is. And to your right is the, giant store and they have so many products in that store like beer they have a lot of beer that's there available it's cold you can get some of their like special release stuff which is their barrel aged things their sours their barrel barrel aged big beers their scratch series beers their regular beers all that stuff you can get in cases you can get it in singles you can get it cold you can get it warm you can get crowlers you get crowlers there fill your crowlers fill which growlers. is kind of nice in the storm mm-hmm. instead of kind of going into the tap room but then they have all sorts of other things like you know keychains and bottle openers and stickers and soaps with beer in them and they do have all one sorts of, the of stuff most clothing fun probably. gift shops yeah. like stores well, it, because their merchandise variety is huge. They have a lot of stuff for pets. That's true. They do have that. Um, and some fun glassware. They yeah. have glassware, yeah. which we are drinking out of our brand new Trogues beer glasses that Rebecca found. And she was like, I really want this glass. I think it's really cool. And I looked at it and I was like, well, if you're going to get one, I feel like I should get a matching one. Yeah. And that's what we're drinking out of for this. Go ahead and describe it. Oh, it's just like a stemless goblet i don't know yeah i mean it's shaped so that it's you know it it, it um, comes yeah. to a point yeah. at the top like you want so you can experience aroma and flavor the best way possible and it has the trogues kind of it looks like a guitar pick you mm-hmm. know like the trogues um logo and then like little hop yeah, it's got like hop vines around it and there's which are like really a lime cool. green color i love the green color yeah. that like lime green and the like just the fun. hops. Yeah. yeah. It's like, really cool. It's like, it's I know really we nice. have a lot of glasses, but I really want this. And yeah. Carlin's like, okay, I want one too. <laughs> I mean, it looks so good. I was like, we if we have to, we'll just get rid of other glasses because these are cool. So, yeah. So, that's their store. Then, um, if you would keep going, instead of going right into the store, you just keep going. And they have their main tap room area, which is gigantic. They have a very large bar where they have plenty of bartenders yeah. working. Lots of bartenders. And like I've said before... Um, Something I, I was talking about on the Columbia excursion episode where saying how it's really nice because Trogues has a designated that, spot yes. for people to order beer. Like they have a spot where you cannot sit. There are no chairs at the bar that says order beers here. So you can form a line. So it's a nice place. Everyone well, the, knows you go there to order. It's very easy to detect where the line is. Yes. And the line moves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 
it was very easy to determine how to get a beer and to yes. get a beer. And that line moved. The food yeah. line was b- backed up yeah, and didn't move line. as quickly. Yeah. Um, but they also have a variety of seats. They have yeah. booths. They have um, benches. Benches. They have regular chairs. They have um, like pub style seats, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of a nice. And there's so much seating in there. Yeah. It's just so much. It's huge. And then all the way at the left, if you're if you just walked in, is where their food area is. Yeah. And then there's also an upstairs seating, and mm-hmm. that's where they have pizzas. Yeah, so there's pizzas in the upstairs one, and more t- designated taps up okay. there. We didn't go up there at all, right? We didn't. But they, I, I had looked, and like they only serve certain beers up there. And what they serve up there, I believe, is different than what they serve at the beer garden. And then the main tap room has like everything. Mm. So then, like we said, with the food, the food is aw- awesome outstanding it is such an awesome place to go because the beer is really good and the food is really 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 good and i do just need to shout out the fact that when we were there i got this chicken sandwich that had pimento cheese on it and it was amazingly awesome and it had like a little bit of a smoke to it but with the pimento cheese it was just like what do we get decadent two sandwiches a salad a pretzel and cheesecake yeah yeah yes it was but we we split we split the two sandwiches. Like we split everything. It was a well, lot. Though. It was still a <laughs> it was still lot. A lot. <laughs> the problem is I got in line and I was just like, I wanna eat this and I wanna eat this and I wanna eat this and Yeah, Carlin so and just, Rich came back from ordering food. I'm like, What'd you get? And Rich is like one of everything on the menu. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, the problem on top of that was that it was for my birthday yeah. too. So I was like, if I want it, I'm gonna do it. Let's go. So um one of one of the it's not really a secret, but a lot of people, when, especially when they first go there, they don't really know about it. If you go all the way back as far as you can go in the tap room and take a right, there are some doors, double doors there where you can go through and do like a self guided tour. So if you go through that, at the end of it, there's a bunch of seating there, which is a lot quieter and it's mm-hmm. more secluded from the the large group of people in the main tap room. And that's seating that's right outside of where their barrel room is, where they do their, you know, barrel each big beers and their sour beers. And they also have a guided tour. So you can sign yes. up. So when you first walk in, there's like a little like host or mm-hmm. hostess at a, a little area. Like, have you been here before? Here's our beers on top. Here's our food menu. Um, so that's kind of nice. Cause I know sometimes when I go someplace new, I'm like, how does this work? What do I do? What is, yeah. Um, how do I get my beer? Yeah. Um, which I'm sure they've experienced plenty of people like that, which is why they now have that kind of host desk. Yeah. That's kind of like, it's a good thing. Yeah. It's a, it's a good I idea. I think so too. So, you know, if you want to do a guided tour, that person hopefully can guide you in the right direction. Yeah. So I think that's all we need to say about it. We covered it thoroughly, basically. Yeah. I and, mean, it's awesome. You know, if you yeah, haven't been there, go it's, there. It's you definitely been to Hershey in general, check it out. Yeah. Also at the uh, Hotel Hershey, you know, they have the spa, which is Carlin and I have mm. been there before for special Amazing. occasions. It's really an experience. Um, it's have, very expensive. <clears throat> you don't want to go there that often. Well, a special occasion is what I said. Yeah, very special. Um, and they have um, Hershey, Hershey Gardens, which is beautiful. Um, you can, you don't have to stay at the hotel to go there. Um, and they have a butterfly house there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, like you're saying, there's tons of stuff to do. And one thing I want to point out, like we're talking about the Trogues location and you're hearing us excited about it and we're saying how cool it is. Now that makes me want to point out that not all breweries are worth going to, in my opinion. Like there are plenty of breweries where it's like, if you've been to a brewery, you don't really need to go to this brewery as far as like experiences go. Now, yes, there are some breweries where you you know the experience isn't like awesome, but you can only get certain beers there. Right. But that's not the case with Trogues. Trogues is there is that aspect of you can only get some of the beers there, but it's also just an awesome experience with great food, a really awesome yeah. ambiance, just overall great on every list, basically. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's definitely a place to go if you can make it there. Go. So let's jump to our next beer, which is actually part of their uh, Splinter series, is what they call it, their barrel age stuff. And it is uh, a beer that I think we talked about some time ago because they had it at one of the savers we went to. yes. 
And we haven't had it on the show before, but I've been very much wanting to get this hold of this beer. It's their Freaky Peach, and it's a sour beer fermented with peaches and apricots and aged in bourbon barrels, and it is 7.5%. So they say in addition to peaches and apricots, they also have Demerara sugar added to it as well, hmm. which is interesting. Yeah, And I it's think cork and caged bottle. Yeah, I think that's a good point, though. Like, when I when we decide we're going to go to this brewery, like, I want it to either you don't distribute, so I can only get your stuff by going there. But if you do distribute, I want something different. Yeah, give me a reason to come out there. Oh, can you get it? I'm having a hard time with the, with the uh, cork. Don't break it. The cork? Yeah. Yeah, I won't be able to break the bottle. The bottle's actually pretty... No, I know the cork. I know you're not going to break the bottle. I'm going to grab... I'm going to use this. There we go. I just need something with more grip to it. Uh Uh-oh. Whenever I hear that much carbonation, I'm like, oh no, it's going to overflow. But this did not. And we had a really tough time picking out, because I think it's... If you... They're, um... Cork and Cage, like, special bottles are expensive, but if you got yeah. four, it was a discount. And we had yes. a tough time deciding. Well, and part of the reason for that being is they have a decent amount of these barrel-aged beers they do, and they don't distribute much of them. So when you're trying to not spend a crap ton, but also hit a certain number, it's very hard to make that decision because you're like, oh, now this one sounds good, but this one sounds good, but right. this one sounds good. What was... It's like, oh, what was the one we one of the ones we had in our sampler? Um the Blackberry Tizzy. Yes. Which I think we've had on the show I before. I think so too. I love black. It was yeah. something like I whatever it is, I had it and I love it. Uh look up our seller dive episodes on the Blackberry website, tizzy. people. Uh the Blackberry Tizzy. Well, actually you can just use the search function on the website and put in Blackberry Tizzy and it'll come up with the episode it was in. Um, yeah, that beer is a phenomenal beer. Mm-hmm. And I like, I, I remember that it has like a brown sugar note mm-hmm. to it that just complements everything so well. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, but let's talk peach. about the Freaky Peach. Yeah. It is like... It's like brown, red-ish. orange, red. Yeah. Yeah. Clear. Can't, I mean, it's a tad bit hazy. Yeah. can kind of see through it, though. Mm. Ooh, it smells a lot of bourbon. Yeah. Is it? A lot of bourbon. Oh, Asian bourbon barrels. Yeah, okay. you can you can smell like that bourbon alcohol. You can smell like brown sugar, vanilla, lots of oak. It's almost like there's a little tannic note from the oak. And the base beer of this, do they sell the base beer? No. Okay, so this is like its own. This is its own thing. thing. Yep. Yeah, I know. Ooh, it just it smells. It smells like... so complex. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Like you get those like light fruity notes, and you get um, like all of those barrel characteris- characteristics that you were mentioning. I will say though, I have to concentrate pretty hard to pull the fruit out because oh. the bourbon, the caramel, the oak, the vanilla, the brown sugar—it's just so it's. Those are like darker, deeper scents, yeah. and and the fruit is much lighter. So well, it's I feel like the fruit get. gets me very upfront. It's like a quick hit of the fruity peach. Okay. Um, and again, I, I peach <clears throat> apricot. I wouldn't be able to. But the thing is, those other notes bust in they so they fast yeah. that they overtake the fruit. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Like it's there immediately, but you don't really have time to focus on it. So. I forgot how much I like this beer. Oh my gosh. This beer. Oh my gosh. This beer is like stupid smooth. Especially for being a barrel aged beer. And a sour. That's the other aspect. And it's, what'd you say? Seven and, it's seven and a half? Yeah, 7.5. Yeah. It's very, it's just very. Ooh. Yeah, so I get a little bit of that kind of like sour tingle around the edges of my tongue. So it's letting you know that it is sour. But I'm seeing it's more of like a tart, little tart. It's not crazy sour. I mean, I really like it, and I don't really like sours. There's a lot of bourbon character. Yeah. Like I was saying in the aroma, you taste that bourbon, you taste caramel, you taste vanilla, you taste brown sugar, you taste a lot of that oak, Mm. that nice like woody character in there. 
But you're definitely getting that peach apricot mix. Right. Mm. It is a very light, delicate, barrel-aged beer. A lot of flavors going on in there. They blend so well together, and it's just ridiculously smooth. For ridiculous. Being, Everything about the spirit is ridiculous. I know. Like, for being A, spirit barrel-aged, and B, sour, yeah. it's ridiculously smooth on the finish. Ridiculous. It's all ridiculous. The whole damn thing's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Mm. That beer is killer. I'd say, oh, gosh. And as you continue to sip it, the strength of, like, the bourbon and the caramel and all those notes starts to come down a little bit, and it lets that apricot and peach shine more and more. Uh, oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a winner. This beer... If I could have this available year-round. Because the other wonderful thing about it is it's spirit barrel aged, but 7.5%, which is very manageable. You might mm-hmm. say ridiculously, ridiculously manageable. Ridiculously manageable. It's a very manageable beer. Oh, man. Yeah. So I remember kind of feeling like it took Trogues a while to get into barrel aging. Well, especially sours. It especially took them a while to get into sours. And... I just feel like w- once I tasted what they were doing then, when they finally did it, I was like, it doesn't even matter that they were late to it. It doesn't, because the, st- the product is so good, so ridiculously good. You know, and I don't, you know, we've kind of said, like, Trogues has a soft spot. I mean, I grew up not far from Harrisburg, yeah. so Harlan and I have had, I mean, when they were in Harrisburg, we went there a lot. And, um, I mean, this was back when they, this is, I don't know, it was either Chris or John. They were the ones doing tours. Yeah. Yeah. The owners, like you won't see them now. No. Because they're ridiculously busy. Ridiculously busy. Ridiculously busy. But I mean, this is when they had, first they had like no food. Then they opened like just one of those like little soft Soft pretzels. pretzels, Like (laughs) in those stands, the turning ones, like. Yeah. At the movie theater. And there's something else. Oh, then they had some lady, someone that would make. Brownies, brownies with, with their, their beer. beers. Those brownies they were, were so awesome. good. Yeah, those brownies were great. And there was like hardly any room there. Yeah. Then they expanded that and there was a little bit more seating. But yeah. Oh, God. This freaky peach is just amazing. And then, yeah, remember, yeah, my mom got, got you scratch number nine. Was it nine? No, no. When, when, whenever, when she purchased me one, she purchased... 25. 25. And I remember that because it was her mustache yeah, rye. Right. Yeah. And that beer was really good. Why did scratch number nine stick out in my head? I'll tell you why when we talk about the scratch series. Oh. I'll tell you. Okay. Okay. So uh, now's the part where we're going to talk about available beers. And one of the things I wanted to highlight as Rebecca continues to sip that amazing Freaky Peach is that they have continued to try to innovate and continue to try to maintain their relevance in the beer community. And I feel like they've done a really good job with that. So here's a breakdown of their beers. Their year-round stuff, Perpetual IPA, uh, Troganator Doppelbach, Sunshine Pills, Hotback Amber, Mm -hmm. so it is still available, uh, Dreamweaver Wheat, Java Head Stout, Mm, which is a coffee stout. It's been a while since we've had that. Yeah, it's been a while. We should do that again. Their Nitro Chocolate Stout, uh, a beer called When in Doubt, which is a Hellas Lager. Which we've not tried. I, uh, yeah, when I was doing my research on this, I was like, why have I not heard of this when in doubt? Is that one of the ones it. that's in the... It's in one of their packs. Their packs, yeah. yeah. Which I saw... Remember when we were there and I was like, they should have this in cans. They have no mm-hmm. in Wine World in cans. Oh, okay. And I was like, this is such a great pack. Yeah. And I think it's in there. Then they also have their Le Grave, which is a triple mm. golden. And their Jovial, which is a double. Which, that's an awesome Belgian double, by the way. Uh, Then for their hop cycle, their beers they call Mm. their hop cycle, which represents the hop growing seasons. So they have their first cut Mm. mango IPA done with Comet and Simcoe hops. Then they have their field study IPA done with Citra, Mosaic, and El Dorado. I don't know if I've ever had that. It was available there when we were there. We just didn't try it. But if you really want it, we could go yeah. to the liquor store and get it. It's still available. 
Then they have their hop knife, which is done with mm. Cascade, Chinook, and El Dorado. Then they have their um, blizzard of hops. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Oh. The, hop, the hop. I'm not done on the hop knife. I stopped prematurely. Mm. It's done with Cascade, Chinook, and El Dorado, and then dry hopped with Centennial, Citra, and Columbus. Mm. Then they have yes, blizzard their of blizzard of hops, which is done with Centennial, Chinook, and El Dorado, and then dry hopped with Chinook and Galaxy. So I feel like in my mind, Christmas is. The following beers. Pennsylvania Tuxedo. I love Pennsylvania Tuxedo. Dogfish Head. Sorry. Yeah. I know we're yeah, yeah, Trogues, But um, Blizzard of Hops by Trogues and Mad Elf by Trogues. And I feel like that equals Christmas. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So here are their once a year releases. Nimble Giant, mm. which is a double IPA. A lot of people really love that beer. Master of Pumpkins, which is a, I believe it's bourbon barrel-aged pumpkin ale. It's been a while since we've had that. That's a good one. Mad Elf, which we talked about. Uh, They do a Mad Elf Grand Cru, which I think is higher in alcohol. Kind of an imperial version of it, even though it's already... I was saying, not that you need that. Yeah. Then they do a bourbon barrel-aged Grand Cru. Then, as I talked about before, their Nugget Nectar, they call it an imperial amber, but it's just like a super hoppy amber ale. Uh, then they do a Nitro Nugget Nectar now. Mm. Sounds great. Uh, their Golden Thing Dry Hopped Double IPA, which is a tasty one. I think we had it on a podcast episode. We did. I'm pretty sure. Then their Lolly Hop Double uh, IPA. Lolly Hop. It's so good. Yeah, Rebecca's a huge fan of the Lolly Hop. I will say it is really good. I'm so sad we could not get more of that Lolly Hop. Then their Boysenberry Tart and their Raspberry mm-hmm. Tart. Then one called Orangine, which is a dry hopped double IPA. I'd never heard of that one. Uh, then one called Sometimes Always, which is a hazy session IPA. Hmm. Then their Cultivator Hellas Bach, mm. which we have had is mm-hmm. pretty good. Their Crimson Pistol, which is a hibiscus IPA. Their Dead Reckoning, which is a porter. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. Rugged Trail, which I talked right. about, their brown ale. And Naked Elf. Which has no cherries, but in, and instead of honey, it has chocolate malt. Hmm. Have we had that? No, we have not had that, but I would like to try it. Yeah. I mean, I have to say overall, like, I love what they what they do. Like, yes. I, there aren't a lot of, like, bad beers by Trogues. Uh, I don't think there are any it, bad beers by Trogues at all. I think it's just, like, what do you prefer? Yeah. You like, know? I think it's just like, oh, that's not my style or what, not, like, what I'm feeling. But we had... What? Yeah, we, so we did three samplers, and there was not a bad beer in there. I mean, I think there was maybe, I think their, their samplers were like each five? Yes, I believe it was five. So out of 15 beers, I think there were two that I was like, eh, but yeah. the rest were like super really good. good. Let me indulge myself and go over all their splinter beers they have lift, listed on their website now. This is where I'm going to get... Do they, do we need to drink this one? We'll do that at the end of this. Unless oh. you really feel like you need it. I feel it. like I need it. Okay, My glass is empty. It's Rebecca been needs empty it for a while. And then I also realized on their website, I can read off, they have all their sample packs. Oh. All their packs. So it would be cool to know what's in them. We'll go over it all. You know. <gasps> Man. And then I want to talk about their Scratch series. This is too much. This is going to take... Well, there's a lot to say about Trogues. This is one of those breweries that has a large history Especially at, in comparison to a lot of the breweries we end up doing for the showcase. A lot of them are just like, they're less than 10 years old. Yeah. Trogues is like, they're definitely more than 10 years old. Okay, so, oh, so I should tell you. This last beer is a bourbon barrel aged flying mouflon. It is a barley wine ale aged in bourbon barrels, and it is 11.5% alcohol. Um, they say the malts are Dark Crystal, Munich, Pilsner, and Vienna. Also in a cork and caged bottle, just like the Freaky Peach. So this beer, this particular beer has been on the podcast before, but it's been over three years. So if you want to see how we felt about it back then, you can also search on the website Flying Mouflon. It'll come up. It was one of our... um, Girl Scout cookie ones. Oh, yes. Yeah, it, we were doing uh, beer and Girl Scout cookies. And actually, that was one of our favorite all-time. Was this with Samoa? Yes, yeah. with the Samoas. 
uh, or caramel delights, as they call them now. That was one of the, our favorite. I think it depends what region you're in, because I grew right. up with caramel delight, and yeah, then I moved for to me Maryland. It was Samoas. And I'm like, what the hell yeah, is a regional. Samoa? So, um, yeah, but that was one of our favorite beer mm-hmm. and food pairings ever. Ever. Oh, do you remember what our other, well, one of my favorite other ones were? It was Trogue's Jovial Belgian oh, yeah. Double with Skittles, Skittles, which sounds crazy, but it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, they're both Trogue's beers. Imagine that. All right, so well, let's, uh, uh, it looks like a barley wine. It's brown. It's brownish red. See, see through it a little bit. It just smells so, like, dark, like, molasses, yeah. caramel, burnt sugar. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the uh, first thing that jumped out to me was molasses, for sure. And uh, boozy. <laughs> yeah, it does smell boozy, um, but it also smells smooth. And it smells sweet. Boozy, smooth, sweet. I also think uh, it was a good point you were saying about burnt sugar. Mm-hmm. That is a very important distinction to make. I think you're right on that. Very much burnt sugar in the nose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it smells sweet and tasty. There's a bit of a raisin note in there. I can smell that bourbon to it. A little bit of vanilla. You Sorry. can definitely smell the wood, too. That oak yeah. comes through. I um, And I'm tasting the oak. Definitely on the finish. Oh, mm, yeah. Um, Oak's really in there. But it's also super approachable, easy to drink. Eleven and a half? Me but thinks it, not. I think, but I mean, I think it's very approachable. Like it's, um, you can tell it's boozy, but it's also, dare I say, light and refreshing. <laughs> An eleven and a half percent beer is light and refreshing. That's kind of messed up, but I see what you're saying. It's, um... I don't know if I would take it as far as light and refreshing, but maybe lighter than it should be. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not. Maybe I'll take out refreshing. Yeah. But it is um, light. Mm. Once again, just like the Freaky Peach, there's a bunch of flavors going on in there. You're getting the bourbon sweetness. You're getting the oak. You're getting a little bit of vanilla, that burnt sugar, uh, a little bit of raisin. But it's all mixing well. Right. And you get a little bit of burn on the end from that. Very well balanced. It- Reminds me of... Um, it's easy. Such it, an easy beer. It is. Yes, that's what I just said. It's easy. Too easy. Um, it reminds me of... Um, Trouble? Because <laughs> you get you wrecked real quick? Um, no, I was going to say a, mar- a marshmallow that has been roasted on a campfire. Okay. It has yeah, like that yeah. burnt, like... Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll continue to sip on that, and I will go over the Splinter series, their packs, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Scratch series. <laughs> We're not even at an hour yet. I'm tapping this'll, out. This will go there. too much. Okay, so their Spl- Splinter series. They have their Wild Elf, which we actually have in our fridge at the moment. It is a sour version of their Mad Elf. It's done with cherries and honey, just like Mad Elf is. I've had it before. It's very tasty. We almost put it in here, but we did the Freaky Peach instead. Um, okay, then there's the Impending Descent, which we have one mm-hmm. of in the basement. Uh, bourbon Barrel Aged Imperial Stout with Vanilla Beans and Cocoa. Yes, bourbon and that is delicious. Barrels. Then they have Bourbon Barrel Aged Troganator, which we have had... Actually, we've had the Impending Descent, Bourbon Barrel Aged Impending Descent, and Bourbon Barrel Aged Troganator on the show as well. So you can also search those on the website to get them. And that the Troganator's just Troganator, double Doppelbach, aged in bourbon barrels. Then they have the Bourbon Barrel Age Flying Mouflon, which we just had. The Freaky Peach, which we just had. Their Sir Pesh, which is a sour ale with local peaches. Uh, then they have their Deer Peter, which is a wild fruit ale fermented with nectarines. We almost bought that one. Almost. We're close. Yeah. Then they have their Nebulous, which is a wild ale aged in oak barrels. They have their Farmette, which is a wild saison Aged in oak barrels. And they had they had that when we were there, right? And I think they had a few different versions of the Farmette. It was like Farmette with this fruit, mm. Farmette with this fruit. Then they have their Blackberry Tizzy, mm. which is a sour ale with blackberries, apricots, and brown sugar aged in bourbon barrels with vanilla beans. Delicious. I wish we had more of that. Um, then they well, almost got this one. They had their Mortal Cherry, yes, which is a good. wild ale brewed with cherries. Then they have their Apricot Ferment. Which is the ferment, but with apricots. Now the sampler packs. Which, by the way, hold on a second. I want every single one of those Splinter beers. 
I mean, we could have kind of made that happen, but it would have been crazy expensive. Yeah. They're yeah. amazing. Okay, so they have their Anthology Spring Sampler, which is comprised of Perpetual IPA, Hopback Amber, First Cut Mango IPA, and their Boysenberry Tart. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a good mm-hmm. That's a good pack. Other packs are good. It's a good pack. Then they have their Anthology Summer Pack, which is Perpetual IPA again, Sunshine Pills, Field Study IPA, and their Raspberry Tart. Yeah, I think I like that pack a little bit more. That's why I think is out now. Yeah, we should get that. Then they have their. <laughs> sorry. No. Then we. Then we, we have too much <laughs> beer. We do. I'm sorry. Then we have their anthology fall sampler, which is once again perpetual IPA, jovial. Oh no, I'm sorry. Java Head Stout, mm-hmm. perpetual IPA, Java Head Stout, their Hop Knife IPA, and the Fest Lager. Then they have their Anthology Winter Sampler, which is Perpetual IPA, Troganator, Blizzard of Hops, and one of their Scratches. Which I think the last one was like a Cranberry Porter or something Mm. like that they've done. Uh, Then they have their Greetings from Trog Sampler, which is Perpetual IPA, Sunshine Pills, Field Study IPA, Raspberry Tart, and their When in Doubt Hellas Lager. That's the pack that I saw. That sounds like a nice pack. That's the pack that they have in cans at Wine World. And then this is the one that we did for the show. Most Wonderful Beer of the Year sampler. Yes! Perpetual IPA, Troganator Doppelbach, Blizzard of Hops IPA, Mad Elf, Strong Ale, Dreamweaver Wheat, and the Chocolate Stout. That's an amazing... Yeah. I think I said that that's the perfect party pack because there's yeah. something for everybody. No, that's true. And then that you can get crazy and mix. Yeah. On top of that. Yeah. So then the last thing to talk about is their Scratch series, which we are very, very fond of. Tell us a little bit about the Scratch series. I don't even know. I'm okay. just keep drinking. What What do you remember about the Scratch series? Scratch number nine, and I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. So... The Scratch series is something they started doing very early on when we had been going I mean, I remember Trogues. calling my mom and being like, Mom, I need you to go to Trogues and buy Scratch, whatever. The one in Harrisburg <laughs> yes. when it was small, yeah. Because she worked in Harrisburg and... Because they wouldn't distribute those. No. And for the most and part, they still, they still don't. don't. They just have it available to get now in cans and bottles, I think, yeah. at the brewery. Um, but so, w- once in a while, you can get... You yeah, know, every, now, somewhere. every now and then it shows up somewhere. And like we were sh- saying, they'll put it in one of their packs. Yeah. But basically that's their way of doing research and development. They just do these small batches of beers. They always have them on tap at their brewery so people can come in and try them. They'll kind of get a feel for do people really like this or not. And some of those beers end up turning into regular releases. Like I'm pretty sure the, the Flying Mouflon itself was a scratch for a little bit. Um, a lot of the, a lot of their beers that end up becoming new beers that they do once a year, or, you know, limited run, whatever, were scratch beers at some point. So on their website, they actually have a list of all their scratch beers mm-hmm. that they've done, which is really cool. But I say that, but then I was looking through, and there are certain ones missing. So I don't know if it's like nobody wrote down what it was, so they oh, don't come know on. anymore, but... Because, like, they have, they have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. The one you keep thinking about is not listed. Why do I keep thinking that? And then there's uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. For some reason, 9, it, it's like it never existed. Maybe. And then and then they have them all as far as I can see. But I think there's some missing here or there. But. Was that like a batch they didn't release because it just didn't turn out? No, we had number nine. We did. And it was the most amazing thing we'd ever had pretty much. What was it? It was an espresso stout. I, I think it may have been Imperial, but Are I remember. You sure? Actually, you know what? Was I using Untap then? I know. This is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and figure I this out. I definitely was not. I'm going to try and figure this out. Scratch nine. I don't think I was. I don't yeah, think they were. I mean, were. I think we definitely were. I mean, we were drinking their scratch beers in the single digits. Yeah, we were. Yep. It's just crazy. Yeah, no, I don't. Nope. I I, I wasn't using Untapped at that time. Were you time. using your spreadsheet? Yes. Which 
is on this computer. Well, we'll look it up. But it's it. But I know, I know it was an espresso stout, mm. and we loved it because the coffee in it was just phenomenal. But let me tell you, number scratch number four was Flying Mouflon. Scratch number four. Yeah. Um, their very first scratch was a California Common. We did not have that one. I don't remember having that. I do remember having number five, which was their Imperial Oatmeal Stout. Yes. I remember having that, and I also remember having their number 16, which was a Winter Warmer, and their 17, which was a Glacier Pills. Oh, no. Okay, never mind. So they they did um, number nine twice. They brewed it twice because people uh, liked it so much. That's what I'm remembering. So it's not on here as number nine, but it's here on number as number 19 because they did it two times. And that's an Imperial Double Espresso Oatmeal Stout. Do they have it that's on it there as like also number nine? No. Oh, but you just remember. But I remember that. Yeah, they did it two times because I remember it came out and that's when you were like, Mom, go get this beer. <laughs> Mom did a lot of yeah. runs to Trugs for us. Their Naked Elf was was scratch number 22, that was or 21. That was one of the sad things about them moving to Hershey, though. I know. Mom. Is that they weren't close enough. Your mom couldn't go pick us beer up. Although now she's retired, so she could. If she really wanted to. <laughs> she totally would, though. If you asked, yes, she would. But um, we have extremely fond memories of the Scratch series. And it is really cool for us, personally, to, like we were saying, have had some of the beers in the single digit with digits with the Scratch series, and then go in and grab something like this Oat IPA, which is number 377 in their yeah. Scratch series. And let's be honest, the Scratch idea is an awesome idea. And other breweries are doing it now, but I, yes. to me, I don't know. I know they weren't the first, but they were the first to me. Um, they're the or, first I knew of. Like but... that experimental, like, brewery only. Yeah. So I mean, really, they were the first brewery for me that like i had a relationship with yeah a real connection okay and um now we got to rank these beers they're all good at least it's not hard for me go ahead so my number four is going to be the scratch 377 the oat ipa my number three is going to be the boysenberry tart ale my number two is going to be the Flying Mouflon Barley Wine Aged in Bourbon Barrels. And my number one should be nobody's surprise, Freaky Peach Sour Beer ate with Peaches and Apricots Aged in Bourbon Barrels. That beer is ridiculous. ridiculous. <laughs> um, my, I'm the exact same. Exact same. Mm-hmm. All right. Oh, man. I really love Trogues. I do. And it is a combination, as people I'm sure can tell, between actually legitimately enjoying their beer and just loving, you know, what they have to offer additionally with, like, food and just the overall experience and our memories. Our memories plays into it as well. Huge. Well, you never talked about their water, why they set up shop in Harrisburg. Oh, yeah, because it had good water. They would like the water. And then when they moved to... Hershey, they... Were doing reverse osmosis yeah. to strip it down and re- and recreate the water to be the same as when it, they were in Harrisburg. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's a good point. Okay, well, uh, thanks everyone for going on this Trogues journey with us. Thank you, Rebecca, for drinking very good beers with me. Yeah, I just wish it didn't take so long to get to the beer. Sorry? This is what I say to Carla now. I'm like, I want to drink beer, but I have to record with you to get to the beer. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Yeah, you got to do work to enjoy <laughs> your beers. Okay, thanks everyone for checking this out, and until next time, keep it brutal. This has been a Nerd Circle podcast production. 